Welcome to Food Talk, where we talk about food, fishing, farming, and all things East End. And today, my guests are two of the great chefs on Eastern Long Island, Chef Mike Rossi from the 1770 House, Chef Kevin Penner, who you may remember from Della Femina, also from 1770, but he's now a private chef. Might know more about food than anybody, certainly anybody in this room. No, no, not to, <laughs> that, well, Mike's like, wait a second, wait a second. A few years on me. Uh, but um, we're so glad to have you guys. Welcome to Food Talk. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mike, one thing that I learned about you that I had probably forgotten because we had done some work together, but you're a third generation East Ender. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that because that, you know, you, 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 so you're, you're living a dream being a chef. And as I understand it, you have not worked any other job since high school. You've just been, you, 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 you've, you've been a kitchen man. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's cool. Well, I've been very blessed to be able to do what I do out here um, where I'll, you know, a lot of instances, people grow up out here and move away. Right. Where other businesses, industry, or manufacturing, we don't, we don't have that. And being hospitality driven out here, um, it's a sweet spot for chefs, obviously. So, um, you know, in short, I uh, had great grandparents come through Ellis Island and settle in Sag Harbor in the turn of the last century, 1900s. And um, my grandparents were born in Sag Harbor. Mom's from East Hampton. Um, and, you know, the, so the story goes. But um, we've all been out here our whole lives and still continue to, to live out here. And, uh, we love it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a great, what a, what a great story. Did you end up going to culinary? You just, you yeah, just, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I went to trade school after high school and then right. Johnson and Wales University nice. for Good. culinary arts and actually studied occupational education uh, at New York Tech. So I wanted to teach cooking at some point when I would, always said when I was done in the kitchen, I wanted to go on to do that. But uh, I landed some great jobs and was uh, kind of drawn away from that into fine dining. So that, that's, what, that's where we are now. Well, we're blessed. Now, Kev, how did you end up on the East End? Came out to open Della Femina in 1992. And where did you come from prior to that? Chicago. Chicago. How did they find you? Uh, well, you know, every May uh, is the big uh, uh, National Restaurant Association trade show in Chicago. So everybody from New York right. is in Chicago. I'm working at Coco Pazzo with Pat Trauma. Right. And Drew Nipurant popped in and uh, lured us out to open Della Femina. That's right. Those are, those, those are some fun days. Yeah. Um, now, Mike, just what what what's the favorite? What's the dish that? Re, the, two questions. What dish moves the most at Seventeen Seventy House? What's your favorite? What's your personal favorite dish? Is it one and the same? Uh, I think any any of the fish. I think fish, local seafood, especially in the warmer months when our you know city clientele is here. You know, it's we're fish heavy. So whatever's you know best to use at the time and sustainable and. You know, all the buzzwords, the price is right. That's, that's usually what's great. And I love it all. You know, I, I love anything really raw. You know, a lot of raw fish and not just sushi, but crudo and, you know, any preparation Blue like that. Color. Yeah, exactly, you know. So cool, good. Any of those, any of that stuff. So, yeah, for, for sure it's uh, fish. Kevin, we were talking before, um, before the show about your garden. You have a ridiculous garden. Now, we understand that you're a private chef, so maybe that's part and parcel of that, but, but – Tell our viewers the size of your garden and some of the things you're growing because I, I was uh, uh, flabbergasted at the, at the size of your garden. I mean, I think it's so cool. Well, you can see it actually if you uh, jump on my Instagram. I, I, during the summer, I, I post quite a bit of stuff to it. But I have roughly 32 uh, plots that are either 10 by 10 or 12 by 12. I have a couple of different size. Uh, growing everything from lemongrass to... This year we're going to do some uh, wasabi. I have to. That, that's a harder thing to grow. It doesn't like sun. Mm. Um, you know, uh, many different kinds of tomatoes. Um, every berry you can imagine. Uh, half a dozen lettuces, typically. Um, uh, thumbelina, carrots, celery, red onion, shallots. I mean. Every, every and so your private fennel, clients, bronze fennel, right? You know. And your private clients are the recipient of, of <coughs> these, uh, yes. these, these products. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, basically during, I would say from just about the middle of June through October, I'm self-sufficient. That's so awesome. Yeah. And I now you, you got a, you got an olive oil thing going. I have olive oil envy because 
I saw one of your Instagram posts. By the way, what's your, what's your Instagram handle? Is it at Chef Kevin Penner? Yeah, Chef right. Kevin Penner. Chef Kevin Penner. So you, 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 got, you, got, you got a delivery of like a case or two of this olive oil from Italy. Yeah, I actually have, a, right now I have about eight oils, Tough. eight different ones. Because what happens, uh, and, and right now most of what I have is either from Italy or Spain. And what happens is most of the olives, depending on the cultivar, you know, the, the type of olive, um, pressing happens between October and January for the most part. Like if you're, um, for example, I, I, I was in Liguria watching them press Tagiasca olives in, in January. In Sicily, like um, uh, Castle Ventrano olives, those go in October. And, and every, everything's just a little bit different. But, you know, the long and the short of it is, is this stuff is getting pressed, put into bottles now, I buy it now and put it in wine storage conditions to keep the op optimal, you know, freshness. It's not sitting in some hot warehouse. So here's a question: Is there an olive oil that is sold commercially, like you know, down in the IGA or a storage shop, right? That is, that you would say, look, if you're not going to get this great stuff that I've got access to, you probably want to go with this. There's a lot of good olive oils from California. <coughs> I mean, California Olive Ranch is is mm -hmm. perfectly good oil. You know, right. and, and, you know, when it comes to olive oil, there's a lot of black market activity. Ah, who knew? Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, a friend of mine wrote a book about it called Extra Virginity. And um, it's the fraud in olive oil is overwhelming. <laughs> it, unbelievable. It's not a problem in the United States so right. much. But on the other side of the world, you know, they'll, they'll uh, add, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, can be made in a laboratory. Right. They can they can manufacture flavor like truffle oil. Mm -hmm. You know, all truffle oil. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of of truffle oil is just aroma. There's no truffle in it. Oh, interesting. So <clears throat> they can do this with olives as well. So they'll take some crappy vegetable oil of some sort, hit it with the flavor, maybe add something for color, and then and. and Sell it at, you know, call it olive oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, do you, what, do you, what do you serve at 1770 House as your, as your go-to olive oil since we're on an olive oil jag here? We use um, Sonia Toscano's olive oil. They call it Giulia Tuscany. It's great olive oil. I, I like it. And, you know, on the subject of inexpensive olive oils versus expensive olive oils, I've really seen, and Kevin can probably agree, that, you know, olive oil now leans more towards the delicate, uh, lighter style oils and such. Fruitier. And, and, yeah, fruitier. But, you know, going back and having some uh, Italian heritage, some of the heavier, weightier, more peppery olive Bitter. oils. Yeah, a little bit of bitterness, exactly. So um, when you shop, it's, it's really what you like also. Right. It's like, you know, olive oil and, you know, wine may not be synonymous, but they're, they're one and the same. But there's certainly um, a, a matter of what you like and the, your tastes. Yeah. Really, really, you know, sometimes cheap olive oil, <coughs> I know it sounds funny, but... If it's halfway decent and it's good for cooking and with broccoli rabe, it works. If right. it works, and sometimes yeah, yeah, a lighter you're one browning for, yeah. some garlic in it. Exactly. But you don't want something lighter to finish fish, etc. Exactly. That's my thing. Is I usually use a fruity oil for fish, or for raw preps, crudos, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And exactly. then I'll, I'll if, if I'm making you know uh, 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 porcini risotto, then I'll use maybe something with a little a little more bitterness, a little heavier. Um, yeah. You know. so this, this is the olive oil show, folks. And, uh, <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, all right, let's just let's just change it up a little bit. Um, we play a little game called Food Lovers Companion Roulette. Uh oh, all right. <clears throat> Otherwise known as Stump the Shop. Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. So trying to make us look bad. I find yeah. no, but I, we it's if you get it, that means you're you're kind of weird. No, no. Uh, so I I pulled the word out. The word is. Isinglass. Isinglass? Yeah. It's weird, right? It's kind of weird. Yeah. It's what gelatin used to be. So um, oh. the, 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 the definition from the book here is transparent and pure. This form of gelatin comes from the air bladders of certain fish, especially the sturgeon. It was popular 100 years ago, particularly for making jellies and to clarify wine. With the convenience of today's modern gelatin, Ising glass is rarely used. I'm guessing with the um, 
they, they, they need to have a consistent source for products. Oh, no Sturgeon's point. not going to give no, that to right, you. Right, right, right. You know? and, and, you know, we know what sturgeon is really prized for. Mm -hmm. Caviar. Right. So presumably maybe they were extracting what they took uh, once they took the caviar. Right, right. But, um, all right, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Mike, uh, who would you say are your influences? And don't, don't say Penner because... <laughs> don't be corny. No, right, no, no. But if, um, and if he is, you know, say it. But I mean, yeah. tell me. Well, you know, I have to mention Kevin because Kevin done. hired me at De La Firmini years right. ago. Um, he's, you know, paved the way. For, yeah, student of, absolutely. Of, of culinary arts. And paved the way for a lot of us out here. Right. You know, a little bit, not much younger, but just a, the, the next generation of guys. He mentored a lot of us. And, right. um, you know, as far as other influences, you know, all, everything is an influence to me today. I think mm. that uh, the young chefs coming up and their new ideas are, and it's um, very important for a guy like me in in the restaurant business, in the competitive, really competitive form that, that it's in right now, to see what, to stay current. So uh, we're constantly reading and tasting and trying new things. And then any good chef remains close to the base, to, to the foundations of cooking. So going all the way back to the things that they teach in culinary school from Carême and Escoffier and all of, all of the guys, you know, the greats of, of New York and Chicago and the world and France. So um, I really like to stay well-rounded, use the classic techniques and apply them to really modern cooking and food and really what's happening. Oh, it serves you very well. Is there any, uh, anything new just in the last year, maybe something that's just kind of just came under your nose uh, um, of late that uh, uh, has uh, uh, caught your eye? Or yeah, you, you know, I, it's interesting because, you know, certain things that someone, you know, they'll, they'll preach it as the wave of the future. This is what's going to be new. And um, it usually th rounds out to be a fad, you know. It's, right, it's, it's, like it's foam? Just, yeah. Well, anything, molecular gastronomy <laughs> right. in general. It has a lot of applications. <coughs> we use small fractions of that, but it never went to, That's, that's you know, usually how it works. Yeah, we keep exactly. what We keep what we can use and discard the rest. Exactly. So it evolves back to the simplicity yeah. of cooking. Yeah. And um, I see a lot of guys becoming less ambitious and not in a, just in, there's not 10 ingredients in every dish. It's find three or four things, make them, proc you know, procure great ingredients, make them great, do as little as you need to do to yeah. them, uh, and, and, and you know, present them in a beautiful, really simplistic fashion. And uh, that's where we want to keep it, especially I'm out a, here. You know? I'm a proponent of that. But, but, but Penner has brought us something that looks um, from the other side. This is, this, now, tell us about what you've, you've brought today, Kev. They're just ramen eggs. Ramen eggs. <clears throat> so, okay. you know, you go to a... a uh, a, a restaurant that serves ramen, you're usually going to get an egg like that. And what that is, those these eggs I got from uh, Goodale over in Akabog. Mm -hmm. And basically it's a six, six and a half minute egg. Um, and you would add that when the water's already boiling and time it from that point. You don't bring it up and then cook it for six. That right. would be too much. Also, before we put the eggs in the water, we take a little pin and we punch a little hole in the end of the fat end because that allows, that breaks the, the suction inside and it lets the egg fill out the shell so you don't end up with a flat oh. end. So we cook them, we chill them, we peel them, and then we make a mixture called tare, which is mirin sake, soy sauce, ginger, garlic, um, and a little bit of water. And we give them a soak uh, anywhere from like two hours to maybe like two days. If you go beyond two days, the soy sauce, the salinity, will dry the egg out. Mm -hmm. Kind of cure it. Yeah. So How long have these been in there? Right. I was uh, those have been in, what time is it now? About 12 hours. Okay. And is that why the, the outer part of this uh, hard boiled brown. egg is brown? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Well, I think we should taste them. Yeah. Right? That soft sure. egg yolk is calling my name. I know. I know. <laughs> I've been staring at this since the moment I walked up the set. So let me, let me get, I have a little decorum. We're not real big in decorum here, but um, we'll get a couple of plates. And um, Thank you. I guess I should... I should dish. Yeah, they tend to slide around and, a little and, bit. And and uh, Kev, what's what? That's that's just extra. Okay, so we can just we can just serve and like that. We don't need sure. to put any of this on. No, no, you don't. Okay. They've been they've been well soaking in it. Thank you. Bon appetit, Kev. Let's hook you up because I'm going to eat right off the plate, most likely. We Thank you, Kev. Just that. And sure. That's tasty. Something nice. A little breakfast, simple. right? You know, I mean, you can make these, and you can drop them in a bowl of chicken soup, or you can, you know, mm. um, or they're a great snack. Great, love it. Hey, mommy, mm -hmm. you gotta love egg yolk. What is it about egg yolk? 
It's company. Yeah. And the white is nothing. So, you know, when we first started the show, <laughs> you guys were the various chefs. Oh, we have all great chefs there. They would bring, like, really good food. And I had to be taught by my steamable producer, Ellen Jane Watson. Steve, you only take a little bit of a bite. You don't, you don't start glomming. Because I'm, I'm trying to do the show, but I'm like glomming all the food. So mm. go away, stay. Don't, no more food for me. Um, it's delicious, Kevin. Thank you for bringing that. Great. Simple, nice little thing. Really, really nice and simple. You know, you go to the fridge, pull one out, pop it in your mouth. Life, is, life isn't going to suck. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. Um, that's one of my favorite things to do when I worked in a restaurant was to raid the walk-in. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're, <laughs> we're familiar with which it. Which chefs do not appreciate, but um, as a bartender, you know, we have a special relationship with the kitchen, so <laughs> I just remember going in there. It's barter. <laughs> yeah, barter, exactly. Uh, grab the olive tapenade and a, and a corn relish. Those are like a corn <laughs> salsa that was for a fish or something. Those are my two favorite gloms. I just sit in there and just, <clears throat> that's before they had cameras, right? Yeah. Um, Mike, uh, Again, switching gears. So, um, in all the world, you may pick five people to mm -hmm. invite to dinner with you. Okay. Who would they be? Well, you know, it's funny. I always would. I'm a, I'm a big golfer and always have been. So, I, the first four are really easy. The first three, actually, because I was wondering, what's my miracle foursome? So, uh. after, after hearing the question, you know, the second two kind of rolled in. But definitely the great uh, golfing amateur, Bobby Jones, one of the great amateur oh, sportsmen yeah. of all time. Babe Ruth. Oh, Iconic one. baseball figure, put yep. baseball, the Tiger Woods of baseball, if you will. Uh, George Patton, because I'm a student of history and uh, read probably four or five books on him. Oh, cool. And my grandfather uh, served under him in World War II. How neat. Um, I was going to go Leonardo da Vinci, because who wouldn't want to have a meal with Leonardo da Vinci? And uh, Winston Churchill, because he was a lover of, not, you know, not for his sort of his political side but he loved food he loved wine he made every day a celebration i mean he had sherry in the morning and champagne and yeah, he likes you know, his taste. Th throughout his <laughs> yeah. and throughout cigars his, yeah and cigars and a cigar and he, named after him and he, and he, and he you know he he's got a champagne named after him too he does you're right that was a paul roger yeah yeah absolutely and he did it had a supper club on thursday nights at a famous hotel and it was a, the, the other club it was called and it was only for uh <coughs> the, the men in government you know and he was a anyways a lover of food and wine so there's so, the five so so bobby jones mm -hmm. did bobby jones design Augusta Montauk National? Da Mont Montauk Downs? No, no Bobby, Jones and, Bobby Jones was a uh, founder of Augusta National. Him and Alistair McKenzie designed that. No, who, who designed? Uh, Robert uh, Trent Jones. Thank you very yes. much, Robert Trent Jones. Which Robert Jones, Bobby Jones, forgive me. Okay, right. No, course, I was yeah. close. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. so Robert Jones, Babe Ruth, mm -hmm. Winston Churchill, George Patton, and Leonardo da Vinci. That's awesome. That's an awesome five. <laughs> now, you and I went over your five, so my, my they were all Cubs They players. were all Cubs. <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, this man <laughs> is a Cubs fan from a way back when. I would torture him, or we would always talk baseball because I'm one of these. I'm, I'm yeah, a long during, during the late late nineties, we'd be talking on the phone. He'd be like, "You should come over to my side. It's so <laughs> nice over here." <laughs> <laughs> 1908 is a long wait, but um, we got so it. So we, we'll we'll talk about the five that I chose for you. But what what are your five five people to invite to dinner? You know, I kind of like to mix it up. Uh, probably more food world people. Actually, I would need to have like a dozen of these dinners probably. <laughs> Uh, but sticking with the food people first, I think I would probably do Julia Child, yeah. NFK Fisher, okay, um, Jean Louis Paladin, the great chef from France who had the restaurant at the Watergate Hotel in uh, Washington D.C. Who died, um, I don't know, maybe ten years ago out in Vegas. Um, who else? Maybe Jacques Pepin. Everybody likes to eat, drink, mm -hmm. and maybe someone like Obama, because I liked his appearance on Anthony Bourdain. Mm -hmm. He's a foodie. Yeah, he's, yeah, he is. He's just pretty normal. And he guy. seems like a, yeah, yeah, like a nice guy. Yeah. And yeah. I've I've met I think most of the other presidents. I haven't I've never met him. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, you take your kill two birds with one stone. You're, yeah. you're one of my five, and by the way, I need to meet you. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Excellent selections. Um, I've already forgot what mine were. I think I I changed mine. I think I ended up having. Like my father, my son, um, my aunt Julia, my Grammy Hawili, and then I think Jesus, which is like okay, fine. But <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> um, Ernie Banks. For Ernie, well, we had you're just a what were your five? We had Ernie, Ernie Banks, Don Kessinger, um, Ron Santo, Randy Hundley, and um, Fergus Jenks. Yep. <laughs> Are you baseball fans? You either get it or you're like. 
Please talk about something else. Um, <laughs> let's talk about your influences. My influence? You mean like uh, culinary influences? Well, you know, I mean, pretty wide ranging. Uh, uh, um, I worked at Charlie Trotter's in Chicago right, before. Right. Uh, certainly him and Jean Louis Peladin. Um, you know, um, honestly, once you once you develop technique to a certain degree, I think you look outside of the cooks, and for me that meant looking to farmers. I grew up in Iowa. Right. We had gardens g growing up. And you were a philosophy major at the University of Iowa. Yeah. Correct? Yep. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and <clears throat> you know, it's for me. I mean, I I grew up growing things, and I still like to do that. So the farm or, or the stuff we have to work with really means a lot. So let's talk about seeds. <coughs> okay. okay. I'm on a little bit of thin ice here, but my understanding is just that Monsanto controls a lot of the seeds. Uh, for a lot of the big commercial crops. Okay. So do us East Enders have to be concerned about some of the food that's being sourced from the local farms. Um, you mean GMO crops? Yeah. No. Right. Because the only GMO stuff out there that's been planted really is what, like cotton and soy? Maybe rice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you really have to be careful who, where you're sourcing your stuff from. You know, a lot of these guys have their mission statements and the things that they, you know, stand behind and um, they will tell you where, you know, what, where they're buying and what they're putting on it. So. Uh, that's our job. That's the farmer's job to, you know, if we're not, you know, we're not, that's what we need to be doing right, you know. Yeah, and uh, again, you know, these, pe the people out on the east end, both the North Fork and the South Fork, nobody's like, nobody's a mega producer. No, product. they're right. very so, small farms. So, so yeah. Monsanto, the Monsanto seeds are more for mega producers. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Big commercial but then, But then how do you, so you, you're going to get your seeds from your previous crop, Right, necessarily, or no, you're not buy necessarily. Organic seed? Yeah, oh yeah, a lot of these guys purchase purchase seed, and they're they're getting it from great sources too. Okay. Yeah, 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 and a lot of people save seeds too, mm -hmm. and and, right. and they adapt the seeds to the climate. All right. Um, Stephanie Gaylor over at um, uh, Invincible uh, Summer Farms uh, up in South Hold, she does a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah, that's wild. You know, when you're you know keeping your heirloom tomato seeds and keeping you know growing the same thing for so many years. Well, it also it gives you the opportunity for, you know, uh, developing new new uh, um, new crops, I mean. New strains. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you can do it open pollination, obviously. Well, you know, uh, uh, wow. Carissa Wachter from um, Carissa's Bread, she has a starter from, I think, 1973. Oh, I'm that sure. Mr. Cuevas gave her, like gifted her, and that's the, st mm. the starter that she oh, still yeah, uses. There are some out there that are hundreds of years yeah, old. Yeah. The sourdough starters and stuff that yeah, went I way think, back, yeah. I think that's her starter. Yeah. I think the sourdough, that's amazing. Mm. I love what that. Call, what do you call it? Palouche, don't they? I think that's yeah, Palouche. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Um, Too bad you didn't ask us that one. That week I know, Palouche. You <laughs> yeah, no, listen, I got, I got right? stung one time. Somebody, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 you guys would be stumping my, my butt. Um, uh, What's, no, what farms um, are you, I know it depends on what time of year, mm -hmm. you, you got any uh, favorite farms that you're, you're into for your 70, 70 house menu? Absolutely, of course. Uh, you know, I've been working with, going way back now, um, with Balsam Farms, you know, Ian and Alex. Right. Uh, they're they rock run the stars. Show. They run the show. They're great guys. They're personal friends of mine. Uh, we work hand in hand with what they grow for us, and and uh, you know specifically things that I want to use through the year. Uh, love amber waves. Some right. they use their wheat berries and some of their grains, some of their cool stuff. You know, like their flower tops and all this, you know, brassica flower and all these really, really cool things. So um, a lot of the basic stuff comes from them, and a lot of the you know interesting things come from other people. Love the Browders. Speaking of eggs, they're super on the North Fork chicken. Right. And her eggs are unbelievable. Really. Um, yeah. As yep. these were unbelievable too. They're great for. We, you know, we do breakfast, so we do a lot of our, uh, use all those eggs for breakfast there and, and a lot of our baking, and what a difference. So, you um, use Browder's eggs yeah, for breakfast? Absolutely. Oh, that's good to know. Absolutely, yeah, 100% for our in-breakfast and for, uh, and like I said, for cooking and such. So, you know, that those would be the, the big two strong sources of things, and uh, they've been so solid for us and consistent. It's really important to remember, you know, um, and it isn't a judgment, but, you know, a lot of times we talk about local food and, and it, it, it's it's great to use it in any capacity, whether it's just a few things in your restaurant, anything you're contributing. But you know, we try to 
start at the core with things. So the base of my soups and stocks and sauces, the carrots, the celery, the onions. Mm. So it's not just on the necessarily the plated items Foundation. like the tomato yeah. salad. Yeah. You know, there's a ton of local tomato salads out there. But to, you know, eat restaurants that I really live by <coughs> that, uh, the belief that, you know, maybe things that you don't always see. Things, like I said, in the foundations of our so soups and stocks and such um, are also purchased locally instead of, you know, the mass produced giant bags of carrots and stuff. But every, everybody, carrots. Yeah, everybody does yeah. what they can, and it's not it's never right. a judgment. I think it's great if you're just using a few things, you, whatever, it, at, at any capacity, it helps, you know, the cause. Well said. I have to say, you know, um, I've been out here for, for 25 years, and I've, I've watched both of your careers, and it's just such a, a pleasure and an honor to have you guys on here and to watch you guys grow and flourish. It's really, really cool. Um, do you ever hook him up with any produce, or is that just for your? You know, I was line? meaning to last year, and I didn't. I didn't. Wait. I meant I just, to. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love it. Yeah, that's actually I, super. I, I get a little busy, you know. Yeah, I, no, but uh, no, definitely. Uh, we'll we'll hook him up this year for sure. Good, good, yeah, good. That sounds great. And come over and take a tour. Yeah, I eat at home too. I'll take some stuff with me. <coughs> doesn't have to be. I'll tell you what, my celery smokes anything you're going to buy from Belle Cool. That's yeah. great. Your celery. Sure. Mm -hmm. Your celery. Interesting. Yeah. I'm sure it's great. Celery, right? Who would have thought, folks, right? Oh, this guy's got a, an elite celery, which is good. Probably he's got really great full flavor, right? Yeah, it's very um, intense. Um, the The stalks are much more delicate. Um, and it's just there. It stays. Like, mm -hmm. it grows, and you pick it when you need it. It just... Yeah, that's the real huge difference there. You know, everything isn't, you know, harvested in a mass... Yeah, you literally know, everyth everything I work with from the garden is living until an hour before dinner or two hours before dinner. We got about uh, 30 seconds left. Will the Cubs repeat? I like their chances. It's a pretty strong rotation. They went out and got uh, uh, the closer from Kansas City. Wade Davis. What's his name? Yeah. Wade Davis. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, what's his name? Um, the guy who went back. Who Chapman? Yeah, Cha mm -hmm. Chapman made me really nervous sometimes. He threw, he brings some heat, though. Yeah. He's oh, he throws with, really hard. He, He's, he throws really hard, yeah. but. Well, they overused him. What about you, Mike? Agreed. Are you, are you a baseball fan? I'm a huge Yankee fan. Yes. Life yes. Life. Matt Holiday, two words, because he's going he's gonna to give you balance to the lineup. Mm -hmm. He's the right-handed hitter. Three words, play the kids. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, folks, it's been a great show. I thank both of you guys. To my viewers, I say, coge lo suave, pero coge lo. Take it easy, but take it. That's a wrap. Yeah, what's going on? Yeah. Good show, guys. Hey.